Welcome to our last of four sustainability webinars we held this spring. My name is Karin Verschuren. I'm a doctoral student here at Teachers College and will be your host today. Um, the pilot was initiated by the Teachers College Initiative for Sustainable Futures and the series is sponsored by the Office of Digital Learning with the goal to leverage technology to connect research experts and teachers. And we hope to inspire and provide resources for all educators. In the past three webinars, we've traced the history of environmental sustainability education. We've talked about climate change and the need for collective and individual action, and also the positive impact of sustainability initiatives on school climate. If you missed one of our sessions and would like to view them, you can go to our website, tc.columbia.edu slash sustainability. Um, today, however, our focus is on food and why it matters, and I'm excited to introduce our three speakers for today sitting here next to me. Um, in the middle is Dr. Pamela Cook, the Research Associate Professor and Executive Director of the Laurie Tisch Center of Food Education Program and Nutrition at Teachers College. Um, then on my left here is Meredith Hill, assisted, Assistant Principal and Garden Coordinator of the Columbia Secondary School for Math, Science and Engineering. And last but not least, on my far left here, on your right probably is Debbie Slatkin, co-director of the TC Initiative for Sustainable Futures. Uh, we are using Zoom as our technological platform and for those of you who have not used it before I'll take a minute to explain some of the functionality. Um, first I have muted all participants so you won't hear any background noise. Um, at the bottom you have three functions. One is a chat function, we will be monitoring that all along. Cassidy is here um, to do that. Uh, however, if you have questions for the speakers that you would like to send during the presentation, please use the Q&A option at the right. And it allows all the panelists to see the questions and we will try to tackle as many as possible um, during the last 10 or 15 minutes um, of this presentation. So let me begin by introducing Pam. Pam conducts research <laughs> about the connections between a just sustainable food system and healthy eating. She translates her research into curricula for school teachers and recommendations for policymakers. She speaks about nutrition education and sustainable food systems around the country and internationally. She's the author of many nutrition education curricula and has worked with and evaluated many school based nutrition education programs that are creating school gardens, conducting cooking sessions and working toward food justice. Her work contributes to increased access to nutritious, delicious and sustainable food for all. She completed her EDD and RD from Teachers College, Columbia University. Thank you, Pam, for joining oh, us today. Thank you, thank you. So I'm delighted to talk to all of you about how food connects to sustainability and clearly from, thank you for reading my bio for, um, <laughs> that's what I work on. And this first slide, uh, there we go, just has all of us and the title of the presentation. Food and sustainability has been in the news a lot lately, and this is just three examples of articles that have been in within the last month or so. Um, the one on the top, we produce too much food, the Green New Deal can stop this, is by Eric Holt Jimenez. And if you haven't read his reading and you're interested in this issue, he is a wonderful writer. And this really gets at that we actually, there is a mantra by the big food, big chemical industry that we need to produce more food to feed the global population. We actually produce enough food to feed 10 to 11 billion people, which is where the population maxes out. We're not, we're not growing the right foods to feed everybody well, and poverty is what keeps people from getting enough food. The one on the bottom is about reducing agriculture emissions would be good for the planet and our stomachs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but if we use the right kind of agriculture, we can actually have agriculture sequester greenhouse gases opposed to emitting them, which is what it's doing now. And it's by taking care of the microbes in the soil, and by doing that, we're also taking care of the microbes that live within us. And then finally, the New York Times at the beginning of May had a great article on how would you eat if you actually wanted to care for the planet. So you are welcome to look up any of these that you want online. Teaching about food and is not new to Teachers College at all. This is a great photo of the garden that was at Teachers College at the turn of the 19th century, just, to, just in the 1910s about. And actually right now, if you're familiar with Teachers College, there's two buildings sitting where this garden is. Here's another great posed picture of kids working in the garden in their Sunday best dresses. And also <laughs> there was lots and lots of cooking classes even going on back at that point in time. So not new to Teachers College at all. Fast forward to about the 1970s and we had a person named Joan Gussow 
Joan turned 90 in October and in 1970 started teaching a college class here called Nutritional Ecology, which she still teaches with me. It's such, it's a great course if any of you are, are, could come and join it. Um, and it's really all about how we need to care about where our food comes from in order for people to be able to make the right decisions about what kinds of foods we want to be able to grow and how we want to grow those foods. And that's why it's so important to teach children about food and sustainability. We then started in the 1970s, which was before I was here, a program called Earth Friends, exploring the whole story of food that basically goes through the whole, now what we call the food system, growing food, how it's transported, processed, packaged, where we can buy food, cooking and eating, and then how we can um, either dispose things that go out of the cycle or do things like composting and recycling that end up having them being uh, reused. And so Joan wrote something that's really great that was from 1980 called Food and Nutrition Education and Redefinition. And I think her words are still true to what we do today. So I'm going to read a quote from this. Re Ready or not, nutrition educators may simply have to take on food supply issues since no one else is doing so. But telling the whole truth, teaching people about what, um, sorry, who eats and who does not and why, and about what ought not to be eaten as well as what ought to will make nutrition a politically charged subject. Um, a subject that more than mathematics or reading or even history or social studies will collide early on with powerful economic interest. To teach the right things, simply to ask the right questions is likely to prove unsettling to the largest, largest single industry, the food industry in the United States. However, not to do so is to continue to settle for ineffectiveness. And that's not what we want to do is be ineffective. We want to be effective. And I can tell you, since this was written in the 1980s, there has been a lot of pushback in the field of nutrition and about educating children because there is a lot of people that want to keep what we are doing now, the status quo. And that's what all of us want to actually be able to work against. So food and sustainability, just to give you some of the facts, the industry of food production, Agriculture actually in the United States produces 9% of our current greenhouse gas emissions. Globally, it's 25% of greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture. The rest of the food system actually is responsible for 15 to 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that means altogether food is over 40% of greenhouse gas emissions that are being produced, which is just crazy when we think about it. And deforestation, we have lost 15% of the Amazon since 1970. Two thirds of that loss is for grazing cattle to produce more meat. Um, so the food system is really ending up contributing to climate change a lot. Our ability to produce nourishing food is also going to be affected and poor people will be the most affected. Basically, we will have more turbulence in where food can be produced and what can be produced. And it's not going to affect people like us in the United States first. It is going to affect the people that already don't have enough food. We will also have unpredictable crop losses. We're actually hearing about that now with the floods in the Midwest and farmers not being able to plant. That is going to become an increasing reality. However, there is hope. Um, and that hope is, is that actually what's called regenerative agriculture, which is organic agriculture or biodynamical agriculture, actually, if done well, we could produce enough food to feed everyone, produce better foods that would keep people healthy at the same time as we are actually sequestering all of the greenhouse gases that we're currently putting in the atmosphere. It is just the political will and the, the companies that are making a profit on what we are doing now that is keeping that from happening. So what can we do about this? The first thing we can do is to be a food justice advocate, um, activist. And that is, if you are working with your students, there are great ways that you can actually learn about what's happening with the food system in your community to understand who, who's producing food? Who, where's that food going to? Are there small and medium-sized farm, farmers in your area that are actually struggling? And how can you help people to become aware of them and to support what they are doing? The next is to navigate the environment. And that is to try to seek out the healthy choices that are available in the environment. And that can be working with students that are on our gov government safety net programs, like what's called Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or, or formerly food stamps, that have incentives to get fresh local fruits and vegetables. In New York, that actually is giving an additional 40%. So for every $5 that's spent from SNAP funding, people get an extra $2 to spend on fruits and vegetables from local farmers. Some places actually double it. So learning about 
about those and learning about how you can actually support local agriculture with our food choices is a great way to work on it. The next is to do what's called eat real, and that is to re eat real whole foods. When we have experiences, and we all know this, eating with community, eating with people who we care about, and having good experiences cooking and eating food together, there is something really special about that. And I believe is that's what can actually go against the billions of dollars of advertising that is actually pushing kids to eat foods that are not good for themselves and are also really contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. The next is to eat mostly plants, and that is, Plant-based diets, by and large, are the diets that actually are more, are more easy on the planet. It does not mean, and there's lots of controversy, that it doesn't mean anyone can eat any, any animal products at all. And when we eat a diet that is based mostly in plants, we are being good for ourselves as well as for, for the earth. And so thinking about that, thinking about maybe having challenges of how you can add more plant-based meals, what people are doing, talking to your students about that is a great way to connect all these pieces together. And finally, not too much. And not too much is about really figuring out how we can have not so much a round of large portions of ultra-processed foods that are engineered to be irresistible, heavily advertised. How can we actually work with our students to minimize how those are available in neighborhoods? I've worked with some middle school students who have gone into the stores around their school and said, we want that the chips and stuff to not be as present and the healthier foods that you have to be more present. So it's because they learned about it and they became convinced of it. And once they do, that can actually happen. So finally, before we, we move on, I just want to share a couple of resources that we can actually put, uh, maybe post later. This is something I was part of the um, People's Climate March for Climate that there was several, uh, several different ones of. And this is um, basically, if you look at that first side, everything that I just talked about came from the part that's on the left, the part that on the right, I think gives you some ideas of policies that you can work with. So we would post this. And finally, I want to, um, I do a lot of work with the Center for Eco Literacy that's based out of Berkeley, California, and they put together this great resource called Understanding Food and Climate Change that is for middle and high school students. And it's an interactive guide that has packed with information on this area. So. You can go and use that um, plenty and it will basically bring to life everything that I've talked about. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Meredith who's gonna talk about some practical examples she's done with her students. Great. Uh, let, let me oh. say a, a word or two about Meredith. Sure. So uh, Meredith is, just, as I said before, the assistant principal of the Columbia Secondary School for Math, Science and Engineering. Um, she facilitates learning about sustainable agriculture and food justice through garden-based education, community partnerships and farm to cafeteria experiences. Uh, she founded the school garden in her early years as an English teacher at the school, um, a public 6 to 12 school serving a diverse uh, population of students. And her sixth grade English curriculum developed uh, to teach English standards through food systems, community gardening, and agricultural history. Um, so now as the assistant principal, she continues to coordinate uh, the school community garden and educate students and the surrounding community through hands-on experiences growing food, composting and caring for the garden's flock of chickens. And she's an <laughs> alumna of Barnard College and Teachers College at Columbia University, and we're delighted that she will um, sort of show the practice um, of what happens here Great. in New York City. Uh, floor is yours, Mary. Thank you, Crane. So um, that's me. Um, <laughs> and I, again, Meredith Hill, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my story in becoming a food educator, in addition to sort of being a classroom educator and what that looks like. So I began teaching in 2007 at Columbia Secondary School for Math, Science, and Engineering, um, which was the year when iPhones had only just been released in the US. Um, and even at that point, without, without smart devices, um, television, uh, the internet, video games proved these huge distractions for my students. And they still had this sort of love-hate relationship with the outdoors. Um, I would take my students outside and they were drawn to being out outdoors, but they were also a little bit terrified. They didn't want to get their pants dirty. And if insects landed on them, um, that was sort of the last straw. And so um, I hadn't really thought too much about this except sort of recognizing it. And then ended up um, finding myself running a summer program where students ultimately planted a garden on the school roof. Um, and from the moment that we first planted, my students were completely hooked. Um, everything from pulling a potted plant out of its pot um, to harvesting those first ripe peppers was pure magic to my sixth grade students at the time. 
And it really inspired me to think about how this work could be done on a bigger scale. That led to eventually um, starting a new garden project. We were unable to continue on the roof and finding a vacant lot up the street, actually quite close to here at Teachers College, um, a vacant lot owned by the Parks Department that was overgrown and desperately in need of care. And so we put in the time and energy to take that vacant lot and transform it into our school garden. Um, this process was something that, you know, in, in the moment I just thought, sure, let's do this, why not start a garden? And I didn't really realize what would be happening as we did that. So students had to build the garden from the ground up, literally, um, building the raised beds for the garden, which, you know, requires some pretty serious teamwork, some skills, some understanding of <laughs> math and STEM subjects. Um, creating compost, learning how we could do that from plant matter to cafeteria food waste. Um, adding some, f or learning about really our, our compost friends, um, these worms, figuring out how to sift that compost to enrich our soil, and then really getting to planting and um, building a true garden space. It, our, our garden, I, I should add, includes both, um, in the previous slide, you saw some vegetables being planted and also um, pollinator attracting flowers. So we really tried to look at how do we create a growing system that's akin to the sustainable ecosystem, the regenerative agriculture that Pam mentioned. So that really became part of what drove the creation of the garden, was figuring out how to create this garden space in a way that had minimal impact on the earth. And the more we started working, the more students really connected to that idea. Um, the idea of sort of going green was this just starting buzzword then, and students got really excited about what they could do to recycle, to go green, to compost, to give back to the earth through the garden. Um, and finally, as we built the process, a big piece became harvesting. And as Pam reflected, giving youth experiences with food that challenges the industrial food system and gets them to really think about the possibilities for food in their lives became really powerful. So here you can see some students um, amending the school lunch pizzas to include some healthy vegetables from the garden. Um, and thanks to partnerships like um, New York City Grow to Learn and Garden to Cafe, we were able to share we're, we're regularly able to share fresh vegetable samples from the garden and from local farms with our students um, through sampling through the salad bar and getting them to really experience food and food choices on this different level and, and connecting it to the garden gives them a way to think hey not only is this a vegetable but wow i grew that and maybe i should try that so as I started building this garden, um, I also started to think about what is the curriculum like that we use to teach gardening. And a big portion of it I realized is sort of intrinsic, just the act of starting a garden with youth creates curriculum. Because when you're gardening with youth, you need to sort of figure out what it looks like and how to teach students to engage. And then really students also become teachers. So part of it is that it becomes an experience where students and teachers work together in the garden um, and, and really create kind of a, a sustainable system of growing, um, planting, oops, harvesting. Um, and students develop relationships. They develop experiences with one another as well as with the plants that they're growing. In addition to this, um, at the time, I was able to teach a project-based learning sort of mini semester, a month of hands-on interdisciplinary work. And I chose to focus one of those teaching experiences on the garden. The question that I posed to my students was how can New York City always ensure a healthy, plentiful supply of food without ruining the earth? From there, we embarked on a month long experience to investigate this very question. Um, that took students everywhere from examining what was being offered at their local grocery store to visiting a farm upstate um, where they got to see regenerative agriculture in action actually at a biodynamic farm. And having been an English teacher and, and that being my primary responsibility, I was immediately drawn to figuring out how literacy could work with this experience for students. This led to the students publishing 
a magazine as the project of this project-based learning. So part of it was working in the garden. The other part was thinking about how does this connect to some of these core standards, to these requirements of schooling that are extremely valuable for students and can be really enhanced by curriculum and content that students are drawn to. So they started publishing Fresh Magazine, Youth Voices on Food and Sustainability. Um, and in these magazines, students' voices really came to life. So it became a space where getting out in the garden, engaging on the farm, really drew students in. And then sharing those ideas meant that even my most reluctant writers um, were sharing their thoughts and really delving into what their final project um, voices could be. So I started to think at this point, um, I, I did this curriculum for three years, and again, it was more of sort of an, an elective type um, insert into our school year rather than my full curriculum. And my English curriculum at the time was very much based in social justice. Um, but after doing this work, a lot of my students said, hey, wait a minute, how come we're not doing this in English class? And how could, couldn't we just be doing this the whole year because we love this? Um, and so I then started thinking, hey, why not? This could be really powerful. And so my English curriculum ended up getting a bit of a revision. And I started thinking, how can I use, still teach the standards and the strengths of English class while bringing in content um, was my sort of first in that linked to food justice and linked to regenerative agriculture. And so um, it took me everywhere from thinking about how um, the food industry informs immigration patterns to how we can study communities based on thinking about the way a garden functions. And these three texts um, are both, or all three are um, completely middle school appropriate and even could move uh, earlier or later than sixth grade, but provided really exciting ins for thinking about agriculture as the um, content of the English classroom. Um, at the same time, though, I started thinking about the way my classroom functioned. And something I noticed about the magazine project was that it, it paralleled the work we were doing in the garden. And that work really drew from principles of ecological sustainability. So I'm just going to talk a little bit. I could get quite in depth and go on and on about this, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, and the, the principles and the sort of framework I'm drawing from um, come from systems theorist Fritjof Capra, who talks about um, what the patterns are in a sustainable system and kind of the theory that if we're going to create a sustainable system in a classroom, we can model the classroom space on principles of ecological sustainability. So here are three examples of those principles. The first one, diversity and interdependence, is sort of the idea that the more diverse the members of a community are and the approaches we take in a community are, um, the more sustainable our system. So in regenerative agriculture, that looks like having a diversity of plants, thinking about what plants complement each other and how do they work together. So one might be a flower that uh, keeps a certain insect away from our garden, while one might be a plant that brings a certain nutrient to our soil and thus becomes a friend to a different plant. And so students really started seeing diversity as this concept in the garden. It could also be that as members of a community, we share different views and maybe bring together different recipes to sort of celebrate together and that leads to more sustainable understanding that same principle applied to the classroom looks like students playing different roles. So rather than simply a classroom space where I as the teacher give one assignment and all of my students do the exact same paper, the same work, um, a diversity of approaches means that each student becomes more accountable. Students can go off and work in small groups or work independently and come back together. And those diverse views mean that our whole community is sort of more sustainable and more exciting um, in that students, when they have an ownership of their independent parts and or that their diverse voices are honored and their views and their ideas, then it's more of this sort of dynamic uh, educational experience rather than, 
you know, everyone's turning in the same paper to me. And if they don't do their paper, well, it doesn't matter to anyone but that one teacher. Here, as a community, it matters to all of us. The next one, networks and nested systems. Um, so this is the idea that students um, or that members of a community rather and, and just thinking about sustainable ecosystems members of the community work in smaller uh, smaller systems sort of a system within a system um, in the garden that comes in the form of groups taking on individual projects here a group building the chicken coop um, mm -hmm. the chickens themselves are sort of a nested system within the within the system Students um, being part of student groups. Here are some students who are official chicken caretakers, a group of students particularly focused on making sure our chickens thrive. Um, and in the classroom, that looks like having students work on smaller pieces that again come together. So really focusing on group work. How can individuals become specialists in a certain area and how can that build out to bigger understandings? And how can we spiral our understanding to start with one piece and keep adding layers as we go? And the last one, cycles and flows, the idea that um, a system is constantly changing and it's part of the flow and the natural cycle that allows systems to be sustainable, minimizing inputs and outputs that are waste. And so, you know, in, in gardening, that might look like understanding the seasons, as well as understanding how our inputs and outputs are um, chicken waste, for example, goes straight back into the compost. Understanding how gardening is a year long process and even the winter is an important time to be in the garden. Understanding how life forms follow a cycle and follow um, their own systems. Um, understanding again, chickens, for example, we brought into the garden in order to make it more of that regenerative agriculture space. So students could see that the chickens, um, by giving them, they could help us um, care for our garden by keeping down the insects and the bugs, giving back to our garden in the form of chicken waste, which is extremely nu nutrient rich for our compost, um, and then provide an extra added bonus of eggs that we share as a community. So. Um, all of those things. In the classroom, this one I, I feel like really sort of morphs with the garden and classroom becoming one because the garden as um, creating this cyclical understanding, students become teachers. Here some of my students are giving a presentation where they became the teachers to teach at a conference about the garden. In the classroom, it might look like something like the writing process where students really learn that nothing is completely done you're sort of constantly in this state of working that keeps you balanced keeps you moving um, and is always a cycle it's not just oh we get to the end and we're done but we're constantly reworking and constantly moving to the next piece um, so doing this approach to curriculum really allowed me to not only um, integrate content and be able to teach students content in the garden as well as through text and through understanding about food systems and food justice that engaged them deeply and also allowed us to hit on common core standards and to really you know celebrate what um, the writing process looked like and so we were able to keep the integrity of curriculum while allowing the content to really get students to think about a lot of what what Pam talked about earlier, thinking about their place in the in their planet and their place in their food system. Um, and again, a final piece is giving students an authentic place to publish their thoughts um, here in a food blog um, so that they could have an audience that's outside of the classroom, just like the garden is an audience uh, or has a, a community outside of itself. Um, and finally here, um, these final photos just sort of sum up the, the experience. Um, here is one of my students when we first started working with chickens um, as a sixth grader. Um, those, now we host a flock of three fully grown chickens um, and that same student continues to be involved in the garden. Here he is as a senior just a couple of weeks ago in the garden and still on his own accord um, delving into food systems through his, his, his choice of reading. So I thought that was a fun, um, a fun moment I captured, but to show just sort of how doing this work 
engages students, not just for the moment in the class, but for the long run and for a bigger understanding. Um, and so I wanted to finish with a quote um, that comes from a Center for Eco-Literacy publication, uh, Michael Stone, um, that just sort of sums up some of this work. A sustainable community worth imagining is alive in the most exuberant sense of the word, of the word fresh, vital, evolving, diverse, and dynamic. It cares about the quality as well as the continuation of life. It is flexible and adaptive. It draws energy from its environment, celebrates organic wholeness, and appreciates that a life has more to reveal than human cleverness has yet discovered. It teaches its children to pay attention to the world around them, to respect what they cannot control, and to embrace the creativity with which life sustains itself. So I know there's lots of possible approaches to educating students on this kind of work, but I think at its heart is really jumping into this work gives students an in and gives teachers an in to really celebrating um, these components of a sustainable community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Lou, for bringing uh, food and gardens to life in, in such a brilliant way. Um, last but not least, um, we welcome Debbie Slatkin to this panel. Um, Debbie's a co-director of the Teachers College Initiative for Sustainable Futures, and she has helped faculty develop and sustain research and education programs since the 1980s. And as a bright flame, she's known worldwide for her teaching and writing that blends spirituality, science, and action towards a just regenerative world. Her key focus is helping people connect with the earth and develop a decent relationship with nature and all beings. Aligned with this theme, she's pursuing publication of perspective depiction manuscript. So welcome, Debbie. And we do have a few extra minutes um, if you would like to make um, that piece we talked about a little more interactive. Thank you, Corinne, and both of you, Pam and Meredith. Um, really interesting. And I think uh, this will flow and kind of put a, uh, bring us back to the cycle and put kind of a capstone on the day. Um, Anyway, I like to start my presentations and classes by saying where we are, by bringing awareness to the land that we're on and who the land's original caretakers are. We're speaking from Manhattan, which is the center of original Lenape land uh, that encompasses the Hudson and Delaware River watersheds. Um, extending all the way up to the Catskills, west to what's now uh, Pennsylvania, south to what's now Delaware. The Lenape were pushed off their lands, um, dispersed into bands that are now living all the way out in Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario. And yet there are Lenape living here. There were four active Lenape nations that I know of. Uh, for instance, the Ramapo Lenape, um, New Jersey recognized tribal nation are protecting the land and waters just above New York City. They're involved in several court battles to protect their freedoms. I encourage you to look into this. Um, perhaps some of you are indigenous First Nations people, uh, Lenape or one of the many other um, nations represented nearby. Um, I'm a white settler from Eastern European ancestry. I strive to be an ally to original caretakers and encourage you to do the same. So the, <laughs> that should be there. <laughs> um, the, the premise of my talk is this, that the quality of our relationship with nature underpins all notions of sustainability, including food matters. First, I'd like to um, start with a, a thought experiment that it's gonna be a very accelerated version of, that I encourage you to listen to this webinar recording once it's posted and, and do this at your leisure. Bring this exercise to your classrooms and your community. So what if everyone was in love with the natural world? What would the world look like? What would it be like? Imagine turning on your television, what would be on the news? 
What kind of programming might you see? Imagine everyone's in love with nature, the natural world, the land. Imagine walking around your neighborhood. Who might you encounter and what might you encounter? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? Where do people work? Where do they play? Where do they gather? Where does energy come from? And food, where does food come from? How is it produced? And how do you obtain it? So imagine that this is true, that all people are in love with the natural world. What would be different globally, regionally, locally? Again, I invite you to try this um, exercise yourselves. Um, it's a wonderful exercise to begin conversations and to seed actions to create the future that we want, the future we need. Uh, so try it with your students, your colleagues, your community. Perhaps you imagined in that little bit of time we, that I allowed for this, perhaps you imagined a verdant, fruitful, abundant, vital land and people of harmony, health, and abundance. My guess is you created a regenerative future. Um, so regenerative, I want to, we've already been talking about regenerative, regenerative agriculture, regenerative community. And I do want to continue moving us from talking about sustainability to regeneration. If we sustain what's going on now, there's not a lot of hope for, for changing the world and taking care of keeping ecosystems alive, right? Chemical monoculture, farming, uh, mining, fracking, oil drilling, poisoning lands and waters, cutting forests to make way for development or even for more monoculture fields. Um, that's what's on the left, monoculture farming. The, the image on the right is from my friends a uh, wonderful community garden, Hattie Carson Community Garden in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. I have a resource slide at the end with that information. That's regenerative community-oriented um, farming um, uh, um, setting at its best. Wonderful model. So, this is a recent uh, report of the global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystems, and it's screaming at us. This is, this is the actual wording from uh, this press release in May about unprecedented species extinction, and we're, we're going to have ecosystem collapse. You've seen that kind of news. You know this. You hear this. But, and it's, it's pointing out that we're past the tipping point. We've got to change our ways. We have to restore ecosystems, not just sustain them. Um, so how do we do that? Well, um, they also point out, the researchers who uh, pull together this assessment point out that nature managed by indigenous peoples is in better health than nature managed by government and corporate entities. That's probably not a surprise, but it's wonderful to have evidence behind this. Um, so why <laughs> is that land in better health? Well, um, indigenous First Nations, Aboriginal, traditional ways of life are regenerative. So we need to acknowledge and live as part of nature, not separate from it. Um, you can peruse these quotes at length when you look at the recording. But we need to live like the image on the right, as opposed to how many non-Indigenous people live the image on the, on the left. We're part of that circle of life. 
So um, I'd like to encourage you to look at these traditions, not to appropriate specific practice or spirituality, but as pointers to once again connect us with the land in a mutually thriving way in relationship. Um, and I'll share with you some of my takeaways from attending the American Educational Research Association's meeting in Toronto where I uh, participated in sessions on environmental education, sustainability, and indigenous education. Um, there was a lot of talk about the four R's as they relate to um, indigenous uh, traditional ways of life. And um, these are the four R's from the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Respect, relationship, reciprocity, and responsibility. And these are oversimplified and they're not nouns, they're verbs about relating to the world around us, relating with each other. So how might we apply these four R's to curriculum and pedagogy? Well, let me walk you through some of these and, and Meredith already brought out a lot of this in how you talked about your curriculum and what you've come to. I, I loved hearing you talk. I had no idea what she was gonna <laughs> say. So anyway, um, the curricula and pedagogy need to be land-based where land and non-humans have agency and personhood, where humans are decentered in reciprocal relationship with all beings where subjects are not taught in isolation, because that's not how the world works, um, and where cycles are honored. I love your example of being in the garden in the winter, because I was going to say exactly that. Build your relationships with the plant community and be with them through cycles, through time. Um, the curriculum pedagogy um, need to be um, you know, related to the land locally. Um, so build that relationship with plants and don't just be fair weather friends, like pun intended. <laughs> know the local original caretakers of where you are and how they care for and protect the land. Find out how you, your students, your institution can be allies. Seek out indigenous elders and educators to co-create curriculum and to guest teach. Use interactive pedagogy and adapt curricula to students' backgrounds, their knowings, their ways of learning. Invite them to the design table. And I love how you did that um, and how that just kind of evolved as you were putting these ideas together and putting it into practice. Um, you said, I wrote this quote, uh, act of starting gardens becomes the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> um, incorporate all ways of knowing Western and indigenous. Curricula needs to be, um, need to be relational to place and to the local people and to cross discipline content. It needs to be responsible and responsive to those who've gone before, meaning the ancestors of the place and your audience, the students. To those living now, the local community and your students, uh, your colleagues, and to future generations. So these aren't mutually exclusive, nor are they all inclusive. Bringing it back to food. All beings need food to live, right? All feed one another in a healthy regenerative ecosystem and all become food when they die. It's food for microbes, for insects, for soil, for plants, trees, predators, scavengers, humans. But I'd like to focus on that middle statement. 
all feed one another. I think that's what we really need to expand on and focus on in our teaching um, and in our relationships. So um, how do we focus on that? How do we once again become part of nature and in a reciprocal relationship to assure we're feeding as well as being fed? Well, Robin Wall Kimmerer, whose book Braiding Sweetgrass is a wonderful resource, talks about the co-evolutionary cycle. And it's an, an example of nature will teach us how if we listen. Um, she mentions that uh, humans and plants co-evolved, that plants have trained us to help them thrive. They entice us with sweetness, with beautiful colors. They show us where they thrive and where to plant them, what they need to thrive. And in turn, they feed us, right? They produce more than they need themselves in order to sustain their colony. They produce extra. They feed us and they gift us. So what will we gift in return? She talks about, um, oops, sorry, I'm a slide behind. That's what I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> she talks about right relationship uh, via honorable harvest. And um, these are things that you can peruse, uh, again, if you listen to the recording of this webinar. But I want to bring us back to this, um, that nature, all the beings of nature are constantly talking. They're constantly saying what they need, who they are, asking questions of one another. But we don't, most of us don't know how to hear, don't know how to understand or speak that language. Um, and most of us, I'm saying most non-Indigenous people who aren't living in traditional ways. So um, we need to go back, oops, sorry, I can't, I don't know how to go backwards, but we need to go back to learn nature's language once again um, by observing and listening, which jives with the scientific method. So find ways for you, for your students to understand what the land is communicating. Understanding nature's language is vital. Nature is a second language or a third language, NSL. <laughs> or actually, <laughs> probably better yet, nature as a first language. So I hope I've given you a feel for why it's important to connect with and develop a relationship with the land, with nature. Uh, I've offered experiential workshops for decades to facilitate that connection because it's vital for creating a just regenerative world. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you to our panelists, Pam. Uh, wonderful uh, hearing that message of, of hope about the food industry and your concrete examples of what we can do. Um, Meredith, I think um, showing us how food can lead to interdisciplinary learning and how gardens can provide such a rich um, learning environment. And then Debbie, um, it was wonderful hearing you expand on the four R's, reminding us that we are in the Napi land and making that connection with land and reminding us also that we are, uh, humans are just uh, one species among um, living uh, beings. Uh, so we'll, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I see that we have one uh, question from the audience, but please don't be shy and, and type your questions in the uh, Q&A box. Um, we have one question here from um, Callie Ransom. Actually, I don't know if I can type the answer. Um, no, no. So it says, Meredith, could you share the name of the theorist you mentioned again? Yeah. Sure. So um, that was from Fritjof Kapra, F-R-I-T-J-O-F. First name, last name, C-A-P-R-A. Um, and I first learned of him and his work through um, the Center for Eco-Literacy, um, which Pam mentioned. I highly, highly, highly recommend checking out their website, their resources. Everything they publish um, has been informative and even transformative in terms of how I approach curriculum, not just of gardens, but also curriculum in general. So I. Um, I highly recommend and happy to share some suggestions for those actual titles um, 
with with everyone listening in today. Thank you. We have another question from Laurie who's saying, do you have a book list or suggestions? Um, so Laurie, just, just and, and for everyone, we are um, not only recording this session that will be posted on our website later, but the PowerPoint will also post it. So anything that you've seen written here, uh, you can read afterwards on our website. Again, www.tc.columbia.edu slash sustainability will all be on there. Uh, but maybe um, some of you can can recommend a few. Well, first of all, books just to make yeah. sure that we reiterate the three yeah. books that yeah. were on Meredith's slide that that I know because my son was in her English class were all <laughs> amazingly wonderful to to get students to think about. Um, I think for you know, and I know we have a wide range age of children. There is uh, one that's called Mc McVeggie Fresh Rocks the Mic, and that's by Shannon <laughs> Morris, and it's. Um, by one of our, our graduates of our program, and I think that that's wonderful. And then there's another one, and it kind of has a little bit of a similar title, and I'm not gonna get the subline right, but it's called Alex McGreen and Something with the Kale. Um, and it actually is a beautiful story about how, um, which basically is a little bit based off of the Flint water crisis, um, mm -hmm. and is about how actually food can help us to, to take care of ourselves. So, that, so the kale is, if you are exposed to lead and you're actually having all of the rich nutrients that are in greens, um, eating from nature, that that will actually help. So those are two for younger children that I would recommend. Um, say the names again. So uh, it is McVeggie Fresh Rocks the Mic. I'm pretty sure that's it. The author is Shannon with one N, Morris. And then the other one is Alex McGreen, and something with kale. Um, I wish uh, maybe we could Google it and I could get it. Um, anyway, and I forgot the author's name for that book, but I love that book and I would actually highly recommend it. I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of some other ones. Perhaps we can actually post with the webinar. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. On the website also. For older yeah. students, um, younger students too, I highly recommend the Rethinking Schools publications as well. There's a Rethinking Globalization and a newer Rethinking Climate Change. Um, which presents some examples of teachers doing this kind of work in classrooms and some resources you can use with your students, um, a lot in the food justice realm. Um, and then also, again, the Center for Eco-Literacy, there's a text titled Eco-Literacy, um, which I highly recommend, Smart by Nature by Michael Stone. Um, amazing text for educators, um, again, and then we can post that list with um, some of the text for young adult readers as well. Yeah. Another one just to say, and we'll make sure we put this on the list, which I think was February or March 2018 in the Atlantic by Charles Mann, and it's Can Earth Feed mm. uh, 10 Billion People? And it's about how we tend to look at everything as either wizards that we um, you can use technology to fix everything or profits that we have to actually be thinking about all of the ramifications of our choices and how everything is interconnected and it's a beautifully written piece um, and I think actually some middle schoolers might be able to read it definitely high schoolers could read it and I think would be great Great, thank you. And I had the two pages of resources that you could review. I want to point out that there's also a lot of fiction out there and more and more eco-literacy yeah. will be yeah. published, um, hopefully even in the younger grades. I think more of it's starting to come out. I love, there's two books I love that I put in the resources, Richard Powers, The Overstory, which gives the forest agency forest is a character in the book who and forest is really centered and i really literally mean the forest um and then sue burke's uh, science fiction semiosis has science woven in in a big way about plants uh, the plants have agency the plants are characters mm -hmm. and you can see plant communication taken to an extreme but it's got real science in there that sounds amazing. Uh, and we're looking forward to your publication as well. Um, any more questions from the audience or any questions from the panelists to each other? I see there's some chats. Use, please use the Q&A. Oh, there's some good. Oh, thank okay. you. There we yeah. go. Yes. Somebody put into the chat so you can all get them. Everything we just said. Amazing. Whoever did that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you for putting that. So if you go into the chat um, function, you can see everything we just talked about. 
So um, Meredith, I have a yeah. question for you. It's since now you have students that have graduated, when they've come back, how have they talked about how learning about this all has affected them once they've gone to college or their career choices? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm definitely seeing a lot of those students, the more engaged they were in the garden-based work, it seems, now I wish I had done an actual study, but I, I haven't quite yet, um, it seems that those students are really drawn to fields of environmental science, of environmental biology, or of sustainable, sustainable development and really thinking about the world in that way. I know um, I have a few students whose college choices have been informed by the idea of making sure there's a farm available nearby. Um, as New York City students, part of this whole experience, um, and Debbie mentioned the place-based need, is when you're teaching about it, it's one thing to say, here's some text, we can read the omnivore's dilemma, we can read seed folks, but those stories and that content comes to life when we can actually dig in the garden. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've seen some really powerful examples of students saying, hey, guess what I just did this summer? I went off to work on a farm. Mm -hmm. Or students thinking about that as they graduate. Students saying, I'm not sure what I'm going to study, but I know it needs to have some concept of working with the planet. Um, and Columbia Secondary is a math, science, and engineering focused mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And so we do end up with lots of students who pursue fields of engineering. Something that's been really powerful there um, is that we've developed senior capstone engineering projects where some of our students elect mm -hmm. to design independent projects that are sited in the garden. So it's everything from a, a current projects include a bicycle powered compost tumbler mm -hmm. and a, a solar panel. Um, that are cited in the garden. And so here are students, many of whom are going on to engineering school, who are already thinking about how that work applies in this environmental way. So instead of just thinking of engineering as computer-based and in front of a screen, they're thinking about how does that interact with the planet? And so that's been really exciting to think about. Um, now on the administrative side, building the curriculum in other areas, um, as both of you mentioned, it's an interdisciplinary experience and you know kind of what does that look like so I'm excited because our, our first class my first group of sixth graders are now young adults graduated from college and followed by a second group that just graduated this past uh, spring and so you know I, I it makes as an educator working with this kind of work you start to see that these young people that you are educating um, and that educate you of course are going out into the world and hopefully being leaders of some of this change that that both of you have mentioned is critical. And Debbie, when you were doing your thought experiment, it made me think, what if every, I, I loved it, and what if every time you made a food choice, you thought, am I making a food choice that is showing my love for nature? Mm -hmm. And I think if we really did that and we had our students really understand that, you know, sometimes we make food choices because it, it tastes good for us at the moment or it's what we think we're in the mood mm -hmm. for and not realizing how much we're being influenced by advertising and everything mm -hmm. else. And I think it just might be a beautiful way, like kind of a mindful way to stop and think. So I thought that was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just getting kids to think about school lunch even, what they're yeah. eating and, and those choices and the more students have the demand for salad bar and they want to eat that food and the staff sees that it's getting eaten, that's when you know students want to continue engaging. Actually, all of you who are in, are in schools out there, when Meredith has done this in her school, I think really well, is school lunch is something that is often thought of as this a part, part of the school day. And when school lunch becomes the real center of the school day and becomes mm -hmm. part of the education, becomes that the school lunch staff really is incorporated in the school, it really can be a beautiful thing. And one last resource that whoever's doing the great Googling out there could actually maybe add this to it, is there's a publishing, a very small publishing company called Readers to Eaters, and all of what mm -hmm. they put out is related to all the topics that we have talked about. So I think um, looking at their books, it would be a great resource as well. So thank you very much to all three of you, and thank you to all of you participating. Uh, time to wrap it up. Uh, upon leaving the webinar, all of you will get a link uh, to a very, very short survey. Please fill it out. We love feedback and, and to know how we can improve this type of um, digital learning. Um, and don't forget to check out our website. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much.